Good afternoon. I'm Dan May, the provost here at the University of New Haven. It is my honor on behalf of our planning committee to welcome all of you to the university's 15th annual Holocaust Remembrance. Our ceremony is closely coincident with observances currently taking place all over the world. That such an event has become a tradition at the university is most fitting. What we commemorate today, the Holocaust, was a singular event of the 20th century of modern history. So tragic, so immense in the magnitude of its horror, so difficult to comprehend, even decades after its occurrence, that it commands us as all as teachers and students, and all of us are both teachers and students, to make every effort to cultivate the tolerance and understanding that should be the hallmark of our humanity, even while we are preoccupied with our other ordinary studies. The Holocaust included the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews, one-fourth of whom were children by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. Holocaust is a word of Greek origin meaning sacrifice by fire. The Nazis who came to power in Germany in January 1933 believed that Germans were racially superior and that the Jews deemed inferior were an alien threat to the so-called German racial community. Like all fire, the Holocaust burned wherever the triad of hatred, power, and indifference to suffering convened within Nazi territory. Consequently, many millions of people belonging to other groups suffered death, tremendous loss, and unimaginable suffering in connection with Nazi efforts to complete their ultimate goal, the complete elimination of European Jewry. The thorough persistence of the Nazi regime in effecting their evil purpose, combined with the generally inadequate assistance preferred by the rest of the civilized world, resulted in a loss of two-thirds of European Jewry. The Holocaust was among the greatest of calamities to befall the Jewish people, who in their long history have had many tragic events to recall. Today's observance is intended to solemnly honor, with utmost dignity, the memory of those who were slaughtered. Such an act of respect and remembrance is entirely in keeping with Jewish custom and with what is good and commendable in our general cultural traditions. But that is all that hardly motivates our observance today. Equally important is the opportunity it provides to instill in our students the clearest possible lessons on the importance of ethical behavior, particularly in the context of the respect for human life and dignity in all its manifest diversity. This is an object objective that the University of New Haven takes quite seriously, as evidenced by its sponsorship and cultivation of many other related activities and programs. As just a few examples, the university has established the Myatt Center for Diversity and Inclusion. The College of Arts and Sciences has added a continuing course entitled Genocide in Modern Times, The Call of Memory. The Poland Study Abroad program has con come to involve Holocaust education for the last four years. And each year that visit includes visits to Auschwitz. And this January, the junior university will lead its first study abroad trip to Rwanda, where students will meet with families directly affected by genocide and those who are still rebuilding their nation. Also very significantly, we created the Oscar Schindler Humanities Endowed Professorship, which rotates every three years on a competitive basis to a professor who will dedicate research and academic time working with students to establish principles underlying the highest standards of human conduct, to do research in this area, and engage students students in related research projects. The university's second and third Schindler professors, Marty O'Connor and David Schroeder, and the current Schindler professor, Tim Palmbach, are all active members of our event planning committee who have made significant contributions in shaping and preparing for this event. Ira Kleinfeld, professor emeritus and chair of the university's planning committee, is our master of ceremonies. Ira. Thank you, Dan. I now invite you all to refer to the printed program which describes our ceremony. We begin with the ceremonial lighting of candles, which is in keeping with the Jewish tradition of remembering and memorializing the dead. It has become our custom to light eight candles, one for each of the million Jews who were slaughtered, making six in number, one in recognition of all the other groups who were ruthlessly and wantonly slaughtered, such as Jehovah Witnesses, gays and lesbians, 
and the mentally and physically handicapped. And the eighth candle in recognition of those righteous individuals who step forward to give aid and comfort at great personal risk to themselves and to their families. The candles will be lit by our university student lighters who will now come forward. With our candles now lit, I call upon a group of students from the university, theater department, led and directed by Bobby Della Camera, a student, with advisement from the theater program to director Steve Luber for their rendition of two poems written by Hannah Senesch. And I'll call upon our candlelighters to return to their seats. These poems written by Hannah Senesch were entitled Blessed is the Match and Eli Eli. Hannah Senesch was a young Hungarian Jewish woman who immigrated to the British Mandate of Palestine in 1941 to escape Nazi persecution and to study agriculture. As World War II progressed, she became increasingly concerned for the fate of European Jewry so she enlisted in the Jewish Brigade of the British Army in Palestine and was accepted into a select group of paratroopers. She was dropped into Yugoslavia with a small group whose mission was to enter Hungary to rescue Jews who were being held in preparation for deportation to the Auschwitz death camp. On the night before crossing the frontier into Hungary, she left her army bag, which contained her poetry to that date, with comrades who remained on the Yugoslav side. One of the two poems to be delivered momentarily by our students, Eli Eli, was much later set to music. And that piece was the accompanying theme for our candle lighting just a moment ago. Upon entering Hungary, Hannah was arrested, imprisoned, and tortured but she refused to reveal the details of her mission. Later, in 1944, she was executed by a firing squad at the age of 23. She refused a blindfold, choosing to face her murderers in the moments before her death. For her selflessness, immense courage, humanity, and dedication to the highest of principles, she is remembered and celebrated in Israel as a heroine and role model of monumental proportions. Students.
Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the heart's secret places. Blessed is the heart that knows for honor's sake to stop its beating. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. There are stars whose radiance are visible on earth, though they have long been extinct. There are people whose wisdom continues to light the way, even though they are no longer among the living. These lights are particularly bright when the night is dark. Thank you for such a moving rendition. At an interview some time before his death, Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel was quoted as saying, I believe fervently that to listen to a witness is to become a witness. With that in mind, I have the very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today's ceremony, Isidore Izzy Judah. Izzy was born in Vienna, Austria on September 18, 1921. He was attending business school when Adolf Hitler's minions marched into Vienna in March of 1938. He and his parents and sister continued to live in their apartment until one day he had an altercation with a former schoolmate and decided he needed to leave Vienna for his own safety. He managed to escape on his own to Switzerland, where he remained until May 1940. He then obtained a U.S. visa with the help of a cousin in Vineland, New Jersey, and arrived there on May 13, 1940. His parents and sister had already arrived there. They all settled in Vineland, where Izzy worked as a grocery, in a grocery market until November 1942, when he entered the U.S. Army. He was sent overseas in February 1943 and served in the 37th Infantry Division in the Pacific Theater. He was wounded in January 1945 in the battle to retake the Clark Air Base on Luzon in the Philippines from the Japanese Imperial Army. After spending several months in various veterans hospitals and some surgeries, he arrived back at the Thomas England General Hospital in New Jersey in November 1945, and ultimately he was discharged. During his service, he received the Bronze Star for Valor and a Purple Heart. In the aftermath of the war, Izzy learned that many of his aunts, uncles, and cousins who remained in Europe had perished in the Holocaust. I now give you Izzy Judah.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Isidore Judah, or I'm called Izzy. I was born in Vienna, Austria in 1921. I started my schooling at the age of six and completed the required eight years, which included four years of grammar school and four years of high school. I also completed my Jewish education during that time, including having my bar mitzvah at the age of 13. Religion was part of the regular school curriculum, with each religious group having to take classes of their own. At that time, Austria had a Christian social democratic government, and there was anti-Semitism but it was mostly in larger cities. Vienna was no exception. We as Jews were able to live a normal life until 1933-34, when the name of Adolf Hitler became known. In 1935, after completing my required schooling, I had to decide about my future education. My dream was to become a doctor to help other people, but there were two problems. First, there was a financial problem, and second, being a Jew. Unfortunately, my parents could not afford to send me to medical school. Therefore, I decided to go to business college. In 1934, Austria had its first experience with Nazism, which was illegal at that time. Dressed as Austrian soldiers, Nazi entered the chancellery and murdered the Chancellor Dolfus and appointed a puppet chancellor. His name was Schuschnigg. And we started to hear the word Anschluss, which means to become part of in 1938, there were 1,935,000 people in Vienna, of which were 175,000 approximately Jews. At the end of 1945, there were only 8,000 Jews left. On March the 12th, 1938, when I was on my way home from business school, I was going to my subway station. However, I was not able to cross one of the main streets in the city. The street was called the Opera Ring. Adolf Hitler was entering the city of Vienna. There were lines of people cheering the man whose goal was to take over Austria and the rest of the world. As I got home, my mother was standing in the doorway crying and saying that Hitler is in Vienna. I said to her, I know, I saw him. After the Anschluss, new orders for Jews began. Jews could only go to Jewish doctors, hospitals, shop at Jewish-owned stores if they not had already been destroyed by the Nazis and there were many, many other restrictions. When I returned to school a week later, I asked my teacher why these restrictions were happening. I was told it would be better not to ask if you don't want to go to a camp. The following week, all, Jew all Jewish students were told not to return to school, and unfortunately, that was the end of my business school education. One day, while on my way to visit my aunt, I heard screaming and yelling around the corner. SR troops were rounding up all Jewish men and boys, herding them into a school building, which was across my aunt's house. Lucky for me, I knew some back ways and quickly returned home. My father was there 
And as I came into the house crying and asked why these things were happening, they were our neighbors for many years. He said he didn't know why. A few days later, when I did get to my aunt's house, we heard yelling and clapping and laughing. We looked out the window and saw an SS officer on the fourth floor of the school building, which was the holding pen now, holding a little child by his legs and hitting it against the wall of the building. After the child was completely bloodied, he dropped it to the ground. Two days later, my dad's younger sister came to our house crying that her husband has been arrested and taken away. As she was leaving, there was a knock on our door. We were holding our breath. My dad opened the door, and there was a girl who was a neighbor of my mother's brother telling us that they all had been arrested. Jewish boys and girls did their best to stay together and stay away from Hitler Youth, who were always looking for a fight. One day, one of my former non-Jewish school friends came by and turned to one of the girls and spit on her and called her a Jewish pig and other insults. I asked him why he was doing that, since we all had gone to school together. I turned and punched him in the nose and bloody his face. He answered me, I'll get you, Jew boy. After the incident, I knew I couldn't stay in Vienna much longer. My friend and neighbor, Ada, and I had been discussing about leaving, where we might go. His suggestion was Hungary, but I disagreed. I told him we need to be near Switzerland and Italy in order to leave for Europe. When I told Otto that I was ready to go and asked him to go with me, he said he would not leave his parents. I had never discussed leaving on my own with my parents because they would have never let me go. We had many relatives of my father's side in violent New Jersey. As things began to deteriorate for Jews, we asked him for visas to come to the United States. To receive a visa took quite some time. The first visa arrived was given to my father's older sister and her family. My parents, my sister and I would have to wait. I knew I couldn't wait much longer. That evening, I told my mother that I was going to the Jewish hospital the next morning to have them look a cut on my hand. That morning, before they awakened, I took some money that I knew my father had hidden and left my house with only the clothes on my back. I had decided to go to Switzerland, from there to Italy, and then try to get to the United States. On the way to the train, I bought a small suitcase, a shirt, and a pair of socks. At the train station, I inquired about a ticket price to Bregenz, which was the western part of Austria, which was the last time before the Swiss border. I checked my money and didn't have enough, so I bought a ticket to Salzburg. As I was about to board the train, two SS officers were checking tickets. I said to myself, well, that's the end of that party. They asked me where I was going, and I told them that I was going to visit my grandmother in Salzburg. They looked me over and over and finally said, that I could board the train. As the train, as the train started to leave the station, I said to myself, I'll never see my parents or family again. I looked at some of the other passengers and realized 
that I was not the only one leaving. As the train passed the city of Graz, tears came to my eyes as I thought about my aunt and uncle and cousin who had disappeared from their home in Graz. When the train arrived in Salzburg, I knew I had to stay on the train. I had no ticket, but I took a chance. I was lucky and able to stay on the train to Bregenz. As I got off the train there, I inquired where I could cross into Switzerland. I was very hungry, so I bought a roll and a glass of milk. I was told there was a railroad bridge going into Switzerland and was told where it was. I also needed to know the train schedule and found out there were no trains during the night. There were very few Nazis to be seen and the people were very friendly. At nightfall, I started to cross the bridge on foot. Halfway across the bridge, I heard the word halt. I did not stop. I continued to walk and now I heard halt or I shoot. This time I stopped. Two SS men came up and told me to come with them. At the station, they asked me where the rest of the people from my group were. I told them I was alone. He hit me and said, don't lie to me, Jew boy. Again, I said I was alone. He hit me again and said, you're staying here overnight. I asked him for some water and he said I would get nothing. In the morning, as they walked me to the train station, children and some adults would spit on me and yell, Jew boy, you're going to die. They bought me a ticket to Salzburg and told me that I would have to get on the train back to Vienna. They also told me that if they caught me again, I knew what would happen to me. As I looked at the other passengers on the train, I realized that this train was never going to go to Salzburg. As luck would have, the train suddenly slowed down, and to this day, I don't know what made it slow down. For no apparent reason, I took a chance and jumped off the train. I laid on the ground until the train left. I got up, looked around, and realized where it was. I had been this part of Austria many times because we used to go skiing there. I knew I had to go over the mountain. After two to three hours of walking, I became, came upon a farmer who was herding his cows. He asked where I was going. I told him to Switzerland. He said, you're not going there tonight. He took me to his farmhouse where his wife fed me and let me sleep in the barn that night. The next morning, he woke me very early, gave me some breakfast and said to me, now we're going up to the mountain. After a while, we stopped, and he told me to look to my right, where I saw the SS station at the Swiss border. Soon, as we continued, he pointed me in the direction to the border where I could cross safely. As I came to the border, there were only a sign, no barriers. I crossed and started to go down the mountain. After a while, I bumped into a Swiss gendarme who asked me where I was going. I told him I wanted to stay in Switzerland. He took me to the station, and the officer there told me that I was now a political immigrant. I said I didn't know anything about politics, and he said that was the only way I could stay in Switzerland. They looked at me and saw that I was pretty bad physic in physical condition. I was taken to a hospital in St. Gallen. Until this time, 
My parents had no idea where I was. From there, I wrote to them very carefully worded letter. From the hospital, I was taken to an immigration camp called Hasenberg, where I remained until I received my visa to come to the United States. In order to leave Switzerland, I needed a passport. I received a German passport from the German consulate in December 1938. I have that passport with me, and they wanted to make sure that everybody knew I was a Jew, and they put a big red J in there. I don't know if all of you could see it. Now I needed a, a visa to get to Italy. I had received my American visa in May of 1940. After begging, the Italian council, who really gave me a hard time, I received a visa to go to Genoa, Italy, to board the USS Manhattan to come to the United States. I arrived in New York on May the 13th, 1940, and was greeted by my parents and uncle. Unbeknownst to me, my parents and sister had received a visa while I was in Switzerland. They, was, they arrived in the United States on December 1939. I had a job waiting for me in Vineland, New Jersey, where I immediately went to work. I was drafted in the United States Army in November of 1942, went overseas in 43. I served in the Pacific Theater of War, saw combat on Guadalcanal, Bougainville, and the Philippines. I was wounded in the Philippines while taking Clark Field back from the Japanese in 1945, January. After many surgeries and various Army hospitals, I was discharged in November of 1945. I received a Purple Heart, Bronze Star, Combat Infantry Badge, and a Presidential Citation. In 1946, I met and married Esther Weinstein, we had two children, Geraldine, who is here right now, and my son. In 1964, we moved from New Jersey to Waterbury, Connecticut. After my wife passed away, I moved to Pembroke Pines, Florida, married my second wife, Henriette. When she became ill and was moved to a nursing home in Brooklyn, I moved to Tower One in New Haven. I am a member of the New Haven Holocaust Committee, a member of Temple Beth Shalom in Hamden, and I'm president of the Towers Resident Association. My daughter Jerry lives in Sunnington, and my son Stanley lives in Nashua, New Hampshire. I have two grandsons, Eric and his wife Tamar, Michael and his wife Jennifer. I have three great grandchildren, Sasha, Benjamin, and Mirav. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Izzy, for your message today. I know we all can take a lot from it. And thanks for giving it. While it is of utmost importance to remember the victims of the Holocaust, it's also necessary to pay special tribute to those individuals who offered aid and assistance, who provided refuge or escape, all the while at great risk to themselves and to their families. To gain a perspective on the character of such people who exhibited the highest levels of both humanity and courage, I draw on an anecdote of our second remembrance speaker, U.S. Representative Sam Gadenson, who addressed us in 2005. Representative Gadenson is himself the child of Holocaust survivors, his parents having been hidden during the war by a Polish farmer and his family. Reflecting on the meaning of the actions that that family's protectors had undertaken, Representative Gadenson admitted that the choices facing such a potential helper 
were so awesome in consequence that he could not honestly be certain that if he were in the same circumstances that he'd be able to make the same choice as that Polish farmer. The actions of righteous individuals are worthy of recognition, not only from a historical perspective, but also due to the tragic fact that the world has not changed sufficiently since the darkest days of the Second World War. Since then, the world has witnessed additional organized mass murder and genocide, including the killing fields of Cambodia the internecine strife in Rwanda and Darfur, and most recently in and across the Middle and Far East in Syria and Myanmar, where many hundreds of thousands of refugees have fled for their lives. It's imperative that we remind ourselves and teach our students about our common humanity. With those things in mind, I now introduce Professor Bradley Woodworth and Juliana Bigami. Brad Woodworth is Associate Professor of History with special interest in Russia and the Baltic States. And the man we now pay tribute to, Metropolitan Stefan, was the head of the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria's capital of Sofia in a most critical period. Being just, which means doing the right thing, can require one to reject laws that are immoral. Throughout the countries in Europe that came under the direct control or influence of Nazi Germany, thousands of people were faced with a decision. Would they protect other human beings from cruel, inhuman treatment? That is, would they do what was morally right? even if it meant disobeying the orders of the government. Metropolitan Stefan, the head of the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria's capital of Sofia, made his choice clear in May 1943 when the Bulgarian state ordered for the country's Jews to be deported to Poland where they were to be murdered. He led the church in opposing and successfully preventing this deportation. He told the country's king, if the persecution against the Jews continues, I shall open the doors of all Bulgarian churches to them, and then we shall see who can drive them out. The Bulgarian churches have been the people's bastion in their long struggle for national independence. These same churches, at a moment's notice, will be turned into fortresses in defense of our fellow citizens, the Jews. Metropolitan Stefan, born in 1878 as Stoyan Papgeorgiev Shokov, lived a colorful life. He had taught school, studied at the Kiev Theological Academy, and worked in Istanbul for the Orthodox Church before he was ordained as Stefan in, at age 32. He then went to the University of Geneva, where he received his PhD. Within three years upon his return to Bulgaria, he was made Metropolitan Archbishop, head of the church for the capital, Sofia. Charismatic, multilingual, and highly cultured, he became a central figure in Sofia society. He was also rumored to enjoy himself perhaps a bit too much when abroad. It was said he was the least saint-like of all of those in the Holy Synod, that is the bishops in the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. Jews in Bulgaria were Bulgarians. They had fought in the country's wars and shared life with the overwhelmingly Christian Orthodox majority. But in 1941, Bulgaria felt compelled to cooperate with Nazi Germany, allowing German troops into the country. From that time on, treatment of Jews steadily worsened. On March 10, 1943, the Bulgarian government signed an agreement with the Germans for the 50,000 Jews of Bulgaria to be deported to Poland. The Bulgarian collaborationist prime minister said, Jews might, be, Jews might turn into a great danger. We have to take our precautions. Empty trains were on the way, intended to be filled with men, women, and children who would be taken to their deaths. The papers ordering their expulsion from Bulgaria were already being printed. Stefan had made no attempt to hide his anti-Nazi views, and in sermons he openly taught against anti-Semitism. 
In a crucial conference of Bulgarian prelates in May 1943, Stefan brought these church leaders behind him in his criticism of the government's anti-Jewish actions. He told those gathered. When we ask the state authorities what the Jews of our country are guilty of, they have nothing to say. They took everything away from the Jews, but when they reached to take away their life, the Jews asked for the defense of the church. We cannot refuse it. They are subjected to inhuman suffering. Though the prime minister threatened the Metropolitan with charges of anti-state activity, Stefan persisted. Faced with the united opposition of the country's cultural leaders and clearly inspired and emboldened by them, the king refused the Germans' demand to be handed the country's Jewish population. Many Jews from Sofia had to spend time in the Bulgarian provinces, but not one Bulgarian Jew was deported out of the country. After the war, Bulgaria came under the control of a communist party loyal to Moscow, and in 1948, Metropolitan Stefan was removed from his post for criticizing the church, for criticizing the state for its interference in church affairs. He was held under a house arrest in a small village until his death in 1957. His efforts in saving the Jews of Bulgaria were forgotten until political changes came in the late 1980s, bringing an end to communist rule in Bulgaria. In 2001, the Yad Vashem Institute honored Metropolitan Stefan with the title Righteous Among Nations. Thanks to both of you for reading this tribute to a most worthy man. At this time, I will ask the following individuals to step forward in an act of communal solidarity. Captain Cody Mace, Company Commander, University Army ROTC. Judy Alperin, Chief Executive Officer of the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven. Margie Lipshes Shapiro, Associate Regional Director of the Connecticut Division of the Anti-Defamation League. Professor Emeritus Ben Judd. President Stephen Kaplan, whose support for this event and for the university's Schindler professorship has been invaluable. Professor Lauren Kempton, developer and teacher of the university course Genocide in Modern Times, The Call of Memory. Jackie Corral, Associate Vice President, Philanthropy. Professor Mark Melman, Sidney Perry, our 2006 keynote speaker, educator and community leader and original consultant for structuring this event. Professor Paulette Pepin, Chair of the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences, History and Political Science. Professor Brad Woodworth, Associate Dean and former Schindler, uh, former Schindler Professor David Schroeder and Associate Provost and Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Stuart Seidel. On behalf of us all, they will read the names of those victims of the Holocaust who are relatives of members of our university family. While these names are being read, photographs are being projected for those we have. After the last name has been read, I ask that we maintain a full minute of silence for personal contemplation and reflection. Benjamin Freed, Gisela Freed, Helen Solomon Freed, Miriam Weiss, the Tosk family, Ichimor Phillip, Rachel, Hirsch, Chana, and Groda, Leah Pfefferberg, Prima Drumowitz. Sevek Kaufman, Adek Kaufman, Joseph Glucksmann, Margaret Glucksmann, Morris Chashka, Hannah Chashka. Eliza Gassman, Greta Gassman, Hannah Grunfeld, Laszlo Grunfeld, Miriam Grunfeld. Joseph Klein, Louis Klein, Magda Klein, Milkosh Klein, Sari Klein. David Bober and family, 
Bertha Diamond, Frank Friedman, Isidore Frank, Julia Grosinger. Brigitte Josef, Hertha Josef, Hermann Joras, Selma Joras, Amalka Klein. Ernestine Pischk, Anna Ravjina, Israel Ravjin, Hilke Rosset, Jifra Rosset. Samuel Begelman, Burl Becker, Danny Becker, Edith Becker, Rudolf Benko. Rose Kleinfeld, Laser Kleinfeld, Martha Manas, Michael Markovich. Bertie Klein, Cornelia Klein, Francine Klein, Gabriel Klein, Hermione Klein. Rahil Medved Eva, Shlomo Medvedi, Marsha Mendelovich, Rachel Mendelovich, Arnold Mensch. Illis Solomon, Irma Solomon, Samuel Solomon, Thea Schleisel, Rita Schleisel, Heinz Schleisel. Uh, Jacob Gladstein, Joseph Bloder, Rose Bloder, Carl Kaufman, Regina Kaufman. Iona Fried, Elas Fried, Louis Fried. Hasya Spitalnik, Samuel Spitalnik, Heinz Sternham, Ida Sternham, Herman Sternham, Iboya Tesler. Thank you, dear friends. At this time, our cellist, Thirza Bendokas, and our pianist, Carrie Miller Mag, will perform the Adagio Man Manantropo from the Concerto in B minor by Anton Dvorak.
Thank you so much. Our ceremony now concludes with the chanting of a traditional Hebrew memorial blessing worded specifically in memory of the six million. For this, we are fortunate to have us, to have with us Rabbi Andrew Heckman, who so ably serves this community as counselor, teacher, and spiritual leader. You'll find an English text for the Hebrew at the bottom of your service outline. And after I've chanted the Hebrew, I'll invite you to join with me in the English. May I invite you to please rise. El marachamim shochet b'meramim hamtze menucha nechona tachar kanfe ashrina b'malot kedoshim. Utehorim gizorakiam mazhirim et nishmat kolachenu bena Israel anashim nashim v'tav. Sheni hit behu, Vishenech niku, Vishenni his refu, Vishergo, Pigan Aden, Temenuchatam, Anna Balharachamim, Hastir embeseter kina fecha, Leolamim. Utsror bitsror hachaim et nishmotehem Adonai hunachalatam Vianuchu vishalam al mishkotehem Vinomahar amen Exalted, compassionate God Grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the souls of all our beloved men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and burned. May their memory endure, inspiring truth and loyalty in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Now that our ceremony is over, please be seated. <laughs> I wish to thank all who worked to make it happen and who participated so beautifully today. And I want to salute all who came to attend. In particular, Kevin Myatt and his wife, Gail. Kevin is a member of the university's Board of Governors. His advocacy for community service and diversity and his support of this institution are the main reasons that the university created in his honor the Kevin Myatt Center for Diversity mentioned earlier in our ceremony. Also noteworthy in attendance is John DiStefano, former mayor of New Haven and currently executive vice president of Start Bank in New Haven and also a university board member. And Peter Iliel, who we thank for his support and attendance at this event. At this time, I particularly wish to thank President Stephen Kaplan and Anna Mona Kaplan, not merely for attending, but for their steadfast support and commitment to this event and for all that it teaches our students. 
Also thanks to Provost Dan May for his dedicated participation and to our faculty, staff, planning committee and the other university personnel whose names are listed in the program and without whom this annual remembrance would not take place. And now, finally, at the moment of adjournment, I want to, to pay special tribute to our seemingly indefatigable keynote speaker, Izzy Judah, who has agreed to meet as a guest of our ROTC with students, faculty, and staff immediately after the ceremony in room West Side 111. I repeat, West Side 111. All are cordially invited to attend. And when I say immediately after, I don't literally mean immediately, as long as it takes us some time to get over there. But in due course, uh, Izzy will be meeting uh, with our cadets and students. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>